We're going to find the extreme using the second derivative test. So to use the second derivative test, what you first got to do is derive this, find the critical numbers, because any um, extrema are at critical numbers. Okay. So when we derive this, you get when you derive two sine x, you get two cosine x, and when you derive cosine two x, what you do is first you derive cosine, which is negative sine, leave the two x in the middle. So the 2x coming from, and where this 2 came from is when you derive the inside 2x, that's your chain rule. So you normally would have the back, but I'd moved it to the front. So again, when you derive this, it'd be negative sine 2x times 2, the 2's in front. That's your first derivative. Now pull out a GCF of 2. Replace sine 2x with a double angle formula, which is 2 sine x cosine x. Okay, it's kind of hard for some people to remember this double angle formula. It's a little bit different. Anyways, then right here, as you can tell, I pulled out a cosine x out of both of these. Then, now I can set this equal to zero and this equal to zero using zero product property. Divide the two over, and then what makes cosine zero on this interval would be pi over two. What makes this zero? Well, first, if you move everything over, you get one half meaning minus 1 over divided by negative 2. When does sine x equal 1 half? Well, if you look at the unit circle, when does sine x equal 1 half? When is the height of the unit circle 1 half? It's at pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6. So here are your three possible critical numbers. Now, to find extrema um, using the second derivative test, um, what you're going to do with the second derivative test is you're basically going to find the second derivative, and then you simply plug in these three values to your second derivative. Okay. If it was the first derivative test, you'd make um, intervals with these three as your breakpoints, and then check both sides of the intervals to see how the derivative changes from positive, negative, and so forth. So we find the second derivative, which when you derive cosine, you get sine, negative sine. So you get negative 2 sine x. And when you derive this, leave the 2 in front, sine 2x. Well, sine 2x is going to be cosine 2x times 2. And then the 2 times 2 is 4. So there's the derivative, and if you see here, we plugged in pi over 2, pi over 6, and 5 pi over 6. We plugged in those three values, and when we do that, this equals negative 2 times 1 is negative 2, negative 4 times negative 1 is 4, and the answer is positive. Since the answer is positive, that means it's concave up, because we're plugging into the second derivative. So that means at pi over 2, it is a positive concavity, means up, which means it's going to be a min if you look at this picture. And to get the actual output, you plug pi over 2 into the original equation, which is right there. So we plug it into the original equation. That is our coordinate, and that is a relative min. Pi over 6 into the um, second derivative. When we get that, we get negative 1 minus negative 2, because at sine pi over 6 is 1 half, and cosine um, pi over 6 is 1 half as well. And when you plug that in, you get negative 3, which is negative. So it's a maximum. Negative means concave down. So I found the output at that coordinate by plugging pi over 6 into the function, original. And then do the same exact thing for this last piece. And I kind of messed up here on the math. But you can see this would be negative pi over 3, um, not pi, square root of 3 over 2 is in 1 half. When you break it down, you actually end up uh, it's, it's a number, but if you look at the number, when you do this minus this, you actually end up with a positive value, which means it's concave up, so it's a relative min. Find your coordinate and so forth. So second derivative test can be more useful as long as you know your second derivative. If you don't know your second derivative or it's kind of hard to get, first derivative test would probably be easier.